Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is uh, Kambiz Ranavardi, uh, treasurer for Columbia, D.C., and a graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. First, I would like to thank our partners for this evening, uh, Harvard Club of Washington, D.C., and their members for joining us. Uh, we have a very exciting talk about how sanctions work, Iran, and the impact of economic warfare, which is the title of the uh, most recent and exciting book by Professor Jawad Saleh Yesmahani and Professor Ali Baez uh, on, on the issue of sanctions, and particularly the case study on Iran. And this would be in a conversation with Nazila Fati, uh, author and former uh, NYT uh, correspondent. Um, uh, I would, uh, what, what, just a quick housekeeping, we would record this event and share the link within the 24 hours uh, of, of the event. And um, I would encourage everyone to check our website uh, for uh, the full bio of our panelists. But uh, for a quick introduction, uh, Jawad Saleh Esfahani received uh, his PhD in economics from Harvard. Uh, he has taught at the University of Pennsylvania and Virginia Tech, where he is currently professor of economics. Um, he is a research affiliate at the Middle East uh, Initiative at, the, at Harvard's Belfer Center, and also a research fellow uh, at the Economic Research Forum in Cairo. And his current research is on economic inequality and economics of the family in the Middle East. Uh, Ali Evoez is a crisis group's Iran project director and senior advisor to the president. Uh, he led crisis group's effort in helping to bridge the gaps uh, between involved countries that uh, led to the landmark JCPOA in 2015. Previously served uh, as a senior political affairs officer at the UN's Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs and was the Iran's project director at the Federation of American Scientists. He's uh, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service and also a fellow at the uh, Foreign Policy Institute of the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. And our host, uh, Nazil Fati, is a journalist and uh, uh, a commentator on Iran and also the author of The Lonely War, uh, One Woman's Account of the Struggle for Modern Iran. Uh, she reported uh, out of Iran for, uh, for New York Times for uh, nearly two decades until due to government crackdown and threats forced to leave the country in 2009. Uh, among uh, many awards uh, uh, she uh, she has received uh, uh, of name uh, Raoul Wallenberg Fellowship at the Lund University, uh, Neiman Fellowship uh, for Journalism at Harvard, Shorenstein Fellowship at Harvard Kennedy School and an association at Harvard's uh, Belfer Center. Without further ado, Nazila, sending it to you. Kambis, thank you. Uh, Ali, Javad, welcome. Thank you so much for spending this evening with us. Uh, the book is amazing, impressive. Um, I want to start, Ali, with you. There's a part in the book that talks about the methodology that you used uh, in this book. Can you elaborate Thank you very much, uh, Nazila, for moderating, and thank you, Kambiz, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, of course, uh, we miss uh, the other two co-authors of this book, uh, Professor Nagis Bajorli and uh, Professor Badi Nasser. Uh, the story of the book is that in 2019, at the peak of uh, the Trump administration's maximum pressure policy, I was very frustrated by the fact that uh, in conversations with U.S. policymakers or in the general debate about U.S. policy towards Iran, I couldn't see anything that was really substantive in terms of looking at the impact that the sanctions were having uh, on Iran. And of course, sanctions have been a, a key feature of U.S. policy towards Iran for decades. But in 2019, at the pinnacle of maximum pressure, uh, of course, uh, this was really the talk of the town, but mostly people would focus on superficial uh, criteria like uh, foreign uh, currency exchange rate or inflation rate on an unemployment rate, which was really scratching the surface in terms of impact of sanctions. And I couldn't find anything comprehensive. 
uh, neither on Iran nor on, by the way, any other country uh, that had, had been the target of uh, US or uh, multilateral or international sanctions. Um, and so um, I had a conversation with Javad and uh, Vali at the time was the Dean of uh, Science Johns Hopkins. Um, uh, and Nargis uh, uh, was and is a professor there. Um, so we took the project to size and we gathered uh, a team of economists and social scientists uh, to start uh, each of them looking at one aspect of the impact of sanctions on Iran. Uh, I believe we had around six economists looking at uh, macroeconomic impacts, microeconomic impacts, uh, 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 how this impacts uh, social uh, welfare in Iran uh, uh, and so on, and also uh, social scientists who looked at um, the impact on the Iranian society, on culture, on the medical uh, sector in Iran, even on uh, environmental implications uh, of sanctions. Uh, and we produced these reports uh, under the rubric of Iran under sanctions uh, at SICE uh, Johns Hopkins under uh, Rethinking Iran. Um, and uh, once the reports were um, uh, finalized and they were publicly available, we thought to ourselves that this is great. It's really adding a lot of nuance and depth, but it's still not uh, putting it all together as a, a, and is not painting a big picture. And so we decided to bring it together uh, as part of the book, uh, which uh, you now have in front of yourself. Well, it's, it's very interesting. Um, Javad, if at any point you want to step in and have comments, please do. I, I, I would like to keep this conversational uh, and avoid giving you long time to talk about it. But I'm really curious what led you to get involved in this book you have written about Iran's economy since, um, I, I don't know, I can remember since at least uh, the late 1990s. Why now? Why this book? Well, that's a very good question. You know, uh, I think the first article I wrote on sanctions goes back to 2010 when I was visiting Harvard and it was in the context of Iranian youth, which was the topic I had worked on before. And I uh, described there then how sanctions are most likely to affect the youth because uh, they... Uh, their behavior when you are in college, even before that in high school, is mm, to prepare for a future. So what you think is going to happen in the future affects your decisions now, and therefore your decision now affects what happens in the future. So it has long-term consequences. And I uh, am sad that I, pro I proved right. I speculated that young people will have difficulty getting set up in having jobs, being able to get married, buy houses, and that was going to uh, eliminate hope, eliminate hope for the future. When you are young, I was young, everybody, all of us have been young at some point. If you look back at that time, what really kept us going uh, was hope that if we do uh, X, Y, and Z, study, work hard, and choose the right topic, that in 10, 20 years, we'll be better off. And Sanctions have made that, those kinds of dreams very difficult for young people. And uh, just like Ali said, we were reading a lot about sanctions. It was oftentimes uh, focused on uh, small things and sometimes on big things like evaluation, but they interpreted it the wrong way. You know, in, interpret devaluation uh, is a sign of an incoming economic shock, but it's actually a good response to it. It's the correct response to devalue your currency so you can uh, economize on imports and maybe even uh, produce more for exports. And some of these uh, websites in Washington were using devaluations as signs of economic collapse, which was not correct. Uh, and there were other artificial uh, uh, metrics like how much cash the government had. Uh, I remember an article that said Iran has only $4 billion left in the bank, which turned out not to be true. But even then, uh, these are small uh, events relative to the bigger impact of sanctions in 
you know, reducing the size of the middle class, impoverishing the lower middle class and things like that. We thought a book could have a bigger impact than individual articles. In fact, the articles we wrote were comprehensive, the ones for Rethinking Iran. But uh, having a book uh, at least gives you uh, excuse to have a book talk like these, where we can look at various topics. And I'm hoping that the narrative uh, will be changed a little bit as a result of uh, doing this uh, interdisciplinary work, looking at sanctions, not just from the economic point of view, but looking at, uh, uh, at anthrop anthropological approach, like what happens to people. I mean, we have uh, anecdotes from some 80 people uh, that are guests contacted and they uh, bring to life uh, the metrics that we have, like rising poverty rates or uh, the smaller size of the middle class. And also, you know, we had Ali, uh, who is a specialist in the nuclear aspects of sanctions, as well as the uh, international politics of it. Vali Nas understands sociology of the Middle East political science. I think the book uh, uh, is much better than uh, a dozen articles that we had before in terms of uh, putting the story together. And we can talk a little bit more about uh, what we learned from the book, uh, but there it is. I think uh, the motivation was to affect the narrative. So we have four distinguished author, authors looking at sanctions on Iran uh, from various perspectives, a very comprehensive look. Um, you mentioned youth being impacted by the sanctions. Uh, Iran has been under some kind of sanctions since uh, the 1979 revolution. That's more than 40 years ago. And the sanctions were supposed to force Iran to change its behavior. And now you're saying that the impact has been mostly on the youth. Ajavad, can you delve a little bit deeper into that? What does that mean? Yeah, certainly. But let me first uh, preface uh, my remarks by saying, when we say sanctions, we don't uh, distinguish between different kinds of sanctions. Uh, I'd like to make a distinction between comprehensive sanctions, which is really what the book is about, uh, and specific sanctions, targeted sanctions, sometimes targeting a specific industry, sometimes targeting a specific individuals. The difference between the two is very significant. In fact, when you look at Iran's economy, you're correct, Iran has been under sanctions since 1979. But for the most of that period, it has been these specific sanctions, which uh, do not uh, uh, have uh, this sense of collective punishment, right? So collective punishment is what's wrong with the war, and is what's wrong with comprehensive sanctions. A specific targeted sanctions exclude ordinary people who perhaps have nothing to do uh, with the dispute between Iran and the US. Uh, uh, and uh, the other characteristic of those targeted sanctions is that they are easier to remove. Uh, as our book argues, uh, comprehensive sanctions are difficult to remove. And it has been an obstacle in getting Iran to change his behavior because they don't really have much hope of uh, sanctions disappearing if they do things differently. So, Ali, um, have sanctions been enforced against any other country for such a long time? And have they worked? So uh, some people have told us that maybe the, a better uh, uh, title for the book would have been, uh, instead of saying uh, how sanctions work, do sanctions work? Uh, and the reality is that uh, the book uh, uh, really tries to delve deep in, in answering that question, because depending on what you mean by effectiveness of sanctions, you can come up with different answers. Of course, sanctions have uh, an effect uh, but uh, especially an economic uh, impact that Javad can talk about. But 
um, uh, are they effective in advancing U.S. policy objectives? Uh, and and there, I think the answer is uh, is mixed and mostly leaning towards negative. Um, uh, as you know, not that there are other countries that have been target of U.S. sanctions for a long time, like Cuba, for instance, and, and of course. Uh, Cuba remains as much of a torn in, in, in the U.S.'s side as, uh, as has been the case uh, for decades. Uh, and, and so Iran is not unique in the sense that uh, the U.S. has not been able to achieve its policy objectives. But in the case of Iran, well, you have two uh, uh, criteria that I think are different. Number one is just the sheer quantity and quality of sanctions. Uh, Iran, uh, until Russia invaded Ukraine, was the most sanctioned country in the world. Uh, and even today, by some measure, Iran is the most sanctioned country in the world because despite all the uh, designations against Russia, and a lot of it is uh, designations against individuals and entities, uh, Russia is still primarily uh, uh, targeted by um, primary sanctions and not secondary sanctions. Secondary sanctions are so much more toxic. Secondary sanctions are basically measures that the U.S. puts in place by regulating its own market, basically saying to companies, you have a choice. Either you do business with Iran or you do business with the United States. And given the size of U.S. economy and the dominance of U.S. dollar, it's a very clear and easy choice for a lot of countries and companies. Uh, um, we still don't have a lot of secondary sanctions uh, on Russia, despite the fact that Russia has invaded a neighboring country, something that Iran has not done for uh, nearly 400 years. Uh, but uh, uh, so Iran remains one of the most sanctioned countries in the world and the quality of sanctions against Iran, I would say are incomparable almost to any other country. The second difference, if you look at a country uh, like Cuba, for instance, or Venezuela or Syria, um, uh, and this puts Iran in the same category as North Korea, is that as a result of sanctions, in fact, the threats that Iran poses to U.S. interests or interests of U.S. allies in the region uh, not only has not diminished, it has been augmented over the years. Um, so take the nuclear program, for instance. Uh, when the U.S. started imposing sanctions uh, on Iran, uh, Iran had 164 centrifuges uh, in, in the mid-2000s. Uh, when you were uh, doing fantastic reporting on this. Um, uh, the, the, today, the U.S. has way more sanctions on Iran than it did in, in, in the 2000s, uh, but um, uh, Iran is uh, so much closer to the, to the verge of nuclear weapons. It is literally a threshold nuclear weapon state. Uh, if you look at Iran's support for its partners and proxies in the region, um, in uh, uh, the 1980s, when the U.S. started imposing sanctions because of Iran's support of terrorism, uh, Iran only had one key regional ally, which was Hezbollah. Uh, today, Iran has a network of at least a dozen uh, of these non-state actors uh, around the region with the ability to project power uh, all the way from the Indian Ocean uh, to the Mediterranean through the Red Sea. And you see how Iran has been able to activate uh, this network uh, since October 7. Uh, if you look at uh, the human rights situation uh, in Iran, uh, obviously the regime has become much more aggressive uh, at home despite uh, all of the sanctions that have been imposed. Same applies to Iran's uh, missile program, uh, which not only has uh, uh, today, Iran has the most advanced and sophisticated arsenal of uh, ballistic missiles in the region, uh, it is proliferating missiles and drones to state and non-state actors around the world. So by every measure, uh, the threats that uh, uh, Iran poses to U.S. interests or the reasons for which the U.S. imposed sanctions on Iran um, uh, have, uh, have gone from bad to worse. Uh, and in that sense, I think uh, uh, Iran is kind of in a category of its own uh, in terms of uh, demonstrating how uh, sanctions not only fail to deliver on U.S. policy objectives, but to a, to a large extent are counterproductive. So the sanctions were supposed to stop Iran from going into the direction that you just explained. Uh, and it has achieved exactly the opposite purpose. 
Um, I mean, you, when you think about it, sanctions are supposed to uh, have this uh, deterrent role. Uh, so, so the countries are threatened by sanctions so that they wouldn't want to be sanctioned. Uh, Javad, would, do you think Iran would have acted differently under a different scenario if Iran had engagement with the outside, economic engagement with the outside world, if it uh, saw the benefits of, of a much better revenue flow instead of being um, under tight economic sanctions for over four decades and learning how to cope with them? That's a good question, but also a very difficult question because it involves a counterfactual. What would have happened uh, is anybody's guess. We do know uh, from having examined uh, the data, uh, detailed data that's available in the case of Iran, of what has happened to people's living standards. Uh, not just average person, but also people in the middle class, in the lower middle class and the poor. Uh, and there is no question that there's been uh, the harshest impact is on the poor. Uh, poverty rates have doubled. There are 4 million more people poor today than they were before sanctions. And then there's the uh, exit from the ranks of the middle class. Uh, the middle class uh, in Iran has had a moderating role on politics. Now, uh, one might argue that Iranian leaders uh, have their mindset in uh, having military strength. Uh, they have their allies in the region. They oppose Israel. And those objectives have not changed. But uh, the brief history of the Islamic Republic shows that they're also very pragmatic that depending on what they feel is the political situation inside the country, they behave differently. So with the same objectives, they may have, be, be, they may have uh, behaved in a more moderate way had the middle class had been increasing all these years. Uh, I take your uh, attention back to 2013 when uh, just after a few years after big demonstrations that were heavily repressed in 2009, uh, following the controversial re-election of Ahmadinejad, uh, Iran uh, behaved in a very pragmatic, moderate way, allowed a moderate president Rouhani be elected, and then allowed him to negotiate and sign into the JCPOA in 2015 which was in effect for two years. And at uh, in those two years, Iran's economy grew by 20%. Uh, and a lot of that came uh, as benefits to the middle class and to the poor. And that uh, is much, that's much higher than like the average uh, economic growth anywhere else in the world, right? Yes, but of course it is not nothing to be terribly proud of because when the economy is repressed and you let it go, it grows just by itself, right? Uh, most of the time, I think of the Iranian economy as this jack on the, in the box uh, where it's kept uh, low by force. In uh, normal economic development, we need force to make the economies grow. But in the case of Iran, it is repressed. As soon as there is uh, some more oil money available or even the government changes its behavior, uh, people rush out to invest, uh, to make improvements in their homes and so on. So uh, to go back to your question, uh, Iranians uh, probably would have put more pressure on the government to allow better elections after 2017. Well, it's very important, by the way, 2017, Rouhani was re-elected with a bigger margin. And areas of Tehran that are known as middle class, upper middle class, they increased the vote for Rouhani tremendously. Uh, in Shemiran, which is the richest part of Tehran, uh, Rouhani had 49% uh, of the vote in 2013. Uh, his share of votes in 2017 was 79%. So there was a momentum uh, of uh, home uh, hopes and aspirations of the middle class 
uh, that could have continued. When Trump left the deal in 2018, just a year after this Rouhani victory, it dealt a huge blow to that process of moderation and modernization and economic growth. And then in a way, all bets are off after that. And the regime decided that uh, the avenue of rapprochement with Europe, with the West, uh, wasn't really going to happen. It had its pit pitfalls. It felt it had, uh, the conservatives felt they'd be deceived by the uh, moderates. Uh, you know, Javad Zarif came under a lot of pressure for not having been careful enough or having lied to the conservatives about what was going on in the negotiations in Vienna. Uh, all that proved false because now that the facts are out, Iranians did negotiate a good agreement. Uh, the agreement had just one big flaw, and that was Trump. Uh, that could not have been uh, predicted. So my, uh, you know, I tell people that Iran would have been quite different had Trump not withdrawn from the JCPOA. Perhaps the same pragmatic forces that allowed Zarif and Rouhani to negotiate JCPOA would have allowed it to do, do more. You know, there was a lot of uh, tolerance of private uh, foreign investment in Iran. Tehran was buzzing with foreign investors. Uh, they had built an international hotel that had a direct uh, link to the airport on the other side of the highway. So they didn't have to come to Tehran, really. They could just come to the airport, go to a hotel and exit. A lot of things were happening and all that ended in 2018, in May 2018. So yes, the, to, the short answer is that, although I don't have proof, is that Iran would have been a more moderate country now because its politics is, Iran is not a, a nor, not North Korea. There is politics inside, there's give and take, you know, uh, actions and reactions. So if you look at Iran in that way and you understand its politics, I don't claim to know that, but I do believe there is pragmatism. The country wants to move forward and nobody in Iran, including the leadership, looks to North Korea as a model for where Iran should go. That's interesting. I want to read uh, a few lines from the book because uh, it just resonates with what you said. Uh, maximum pressure and comprehensive U.S. sanctions in general have resulted in political hardening and increased military control over political culture. And worse of all, they have done so while suffocating the voices for engagement and change. So, I mean, you have both argued that the sanctions have failed to change uh, the Islamic Republic's uh, behavior and policies. Um, you also argue that it has sort of silenced uh, voices for democratic change. Um, Ali, I wanna ask you about this, especially because of the violent crackdown that occurred in Iran in 2018 and again last year. What do you think of this? A very good question, uh, Nazila. Uh, look, uh, the reality is, and, uh, of course, dynamics in Iran are complicated, and uh, we in the book were not trying to uh, uh, reduce developments in Iran to uh, just the impact of sanctions. Uh, everything that is happening in, in Iran is multifactorial. Uh, sanctions play a role, but they're not the only factor. Uh, yet it's really important to understand the impact that they're having on the Iranian society. The logic that the Obama administration was pursuing in uh, 2015 when it finalized the nuclear deal with Iran was that at that time, uh, the middle class in Iran, despite years of sanctions and corruption and mismanagement, was about 65% of the society. And of course, the Iranian middle class, for anybody who's been in touch uh, with them or know them, um, is extremely open-minded, pragmatic, uh, likes to be connected to the outside world, and even to, to a large extent, pro-Western. Uh, a force of moderation, a force of uh, agents of change, uh, if, 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 if we want to be honest. And so the logic was that 10 years of economic growth under disagreement, uh, even if it's around 5% yearly, would grow that middle class to around 85%. 
uh, around now, around uh, 10 years uh, from the time that the agreement was, was signed. Um, and uh, uh, this coincides with the time that the ruling elite, uh, the Jacobines of the 1979 revolution, who were in their 70s and 80s, would be dying out by the force of nature. Uh, and the country would be overall in a better place to transition to something better. Now, this was uh, uh, not necessarily an exact science, uh, but the, the general trajectory of travel uh, that uh, the administration at the time was thinking about. Um, now, look at what the Trump administration did. It completely reversed uh, these dynamics. Uh, it pushed uh, huge swaths of Iranian society under the poverty line. Now, one in every three Iranian is under the poverty line. Again, Javad can, can give you uh, the uh, economic data much better than I can. Uh, without any doubt, the middle class has uh, suffered tremendously. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, bright young Iranians are continuing to leave the country. Uh, and in the process, uh, the elements of the Islamic Republic who are best connected and best placed to uh, benefit from uh, sanctions, uh, the so-called merchants of sanctions in Iran, those who control the black market, uh, the smuggling networks, uh, launder money, uh, with, given the lack of transparency that comes when a country is under sanctions. Uh, those people who are, who are usually the most hard men in the Islamic Republic, the ones who have guns, um, have been empowered and enriched. Um, and this, I think, overall does not put the country uh, on a better footing to, to transition uh, to anything better. Uh, in fact, it might result in transitioning to something worse, a military dictatorship uh, over an impoverished population quite similar to what we have uh, in uh, other countries like Egypt, for instance. Um, so uh, that's, that's one element that one has to take into account. Now, of course, the Islamic Republic has always been repressed with or without sanctions. But uh, when a country is under sanction, there is also an element of securitization that comes as part of this package. Um, the US has to securitize Iran, has to vilify Iran, has to demonize Iran and, uh, and turn it into a pariah state in order for sanctions to uh, become more effective, to, to create a chilling effect around sanctions. That in turn deepens the regime's threat perception, because they see this policy not aimed at uh, behavior change, but aimed at regime change. Uh, and, and that basically pushed the regime to become even more repressive at home, because even normal grievances of the population uh, that are completely legitimate because of economic discontent, for instance, are seen as part of the broader package of US policy aimed at undermining the regime. And so the Islamic Republic becomes even more aggressive and repressive uh, at home. As we saw, for instance, in 2019, uh, uh, in a matter of a few days, uh, uh, they cracked down uh, when there was an economic uh, related uprising uh, and the numbers of uh, fatalities ranges between 300 uh, to 1,500 in just a matter of a few days. Um, and so this is also uh, something that one has to take into account. People have this, I, I would argue, simplistic and even uh, naive expectation uh, that a, a bad country, a bad regime, you put sanctions on them and they turn into a democracy. Uh, that uh, example, I would argue, does not exist anywhere in the world. You often hear people talking about South Africa, but South Africa uh, is really a unique uh, case in the sense that in South Africa, you had a ruling elite uh, who had realized that it was at a dead end and was seeking a way out, a, a, an exit ramp. Uh, and that exit ramp was provided in the form of uh, a uh, um, uh, um, opposition uh, with a positive uh, vision for the future of the country uh, in the form of uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, um, who has no equivalence in, in Iran today, uh, unfortunately. Um, and uh, South Africa was completely dependent on the West uh, for its economic functioning, and therefore the West had a lot of leverage uh, to put pressure uh, on South Africa. As a result of sanctions over many decades now, uh, Iran has shifted its economy uh, towards the East, is no longer dependent on the West. The West has 
overused and exhausted its sanctions leverage. Uh, and so we're not really in, in a similar situation uh, uh, to South Africa. And, and uh, Javad often makes this really good point that uh, the South African population also writ large agreed with the logic uh, of sanctions. Whereas in the case of Iran, I think it's a much more mixed picture uh, of those who are so frustrated with the regime uh, who might want more sanctions, uh, especially those who are sitting outside of Iran and are not affected by it on a daily basis. Uh, but a lot of people also uh, see the U.S.'s fault, for instance, in reneging on uh, its obligations under the nuclear deal and, and exiting uh, from the agreement when it was completely unwarranted and Iran was in full compliance with, with its obligations. So uh, again, to go back to the main theme of the book, it really boils down to the fact that none of these the questions have easy answers. It's complicated, uh, and I hope people would read the book in, uh, and will come to the same conclusion. I do. I do hope that people read the book. I just want to add to something that you said that the protests, even though the protests have become bigger, the regime has become more violent too. And like every time it's been faced with um, uh, a protest, political, social, economic, no matter what, it has gone to extreme lengths to use violence and end the protest. So uh, here we go. I mean, even if the, uh, the sanctions were aimed at bringing people to the streets and like forcing some kind of change, that has failed to um, Javar, I want to go back to uh, your economic evaluation. And um, do you think uh, Iran can recover from these sanctions if they are lifted? What does it take for Iran to recover from this scale of uh, economic pressure? Uh, it would take a while. Uh, the most important thing to notice is that loss of oil revenues is one thing. You know, the uh, oil revenues are about half of exports and maybe about half of government revenues. So when they disappear or when they shrink, there is no way that you're going to avoid an economic decline. And that has happened and is, uh, found the decline has found its way to the budgets of average households average Iranian household is at the level of living standard they were 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, Iran has found a way to increase its oil revenues. And it has apparently, uh, I read in the press, it has a way of getting more money or sending, sending more oil out by fine tuning its responses to the nuclear watchdog IAEA. Uh, and that could probably continue into the future because the U.S. doesn't have an easy way to stop Iran from enriching uranium beyond 60%. So it will negotiate with it. You know, the Korean money will go to Qatar and you could use it this way, that way. Or maybe they look the other way where Chinese buy oil from Iran. The one thing that is hurting Iran in the long term, is the financial sanctions. They're very different from oil sanctions. And the government has no easy way of getting around those. What financial sanctions do is prevent Iran from finding its way out of this recession. Iran has been good in allowing the currency to depreciate, as I mentioned earlier. It's the right response. What that does is uh, let Iranian wages in dollar terms to go down quite a bit. Iranian workers outside Iran are cheaper now than the Chinese workers. So if they can equalize technology, they should be able to beat China in uh, Iran's neighborhood, at least. You know, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, maybe even Turkey. Uh, the reason why they cannot do that is because uh, of financial sanctions. If somebody buys something in Turkmenistan from a small producer in Iran, they will have no way of sending them the money. Small producers cannot send someone in a uh, jet plane to collect gold and, or suitcases of his, uh, dollars to bring back. The way 
uh, large enterprises in Iran, like IRGC does, uh, they sell oil on the open seas and they bring, bring gold or um, actual dollar notes uh, to Iran. Uh, this is the only way Iran has found to get around the financial sanctions. The other is the age old barter, where you go to Sri Lanka and you say, you know, here's oil. What do you have? Oh, okay, tea. We need tea. They bring tea. They do a lot of that with China, but we don't know of any country that has gotten into a path of sustained growth doing barter with a number of countries. You need to allow small producers, by small producers meaning those who employ maybe 10 to 50 wor workers. They don't have the means to set up international uh, trading uh, institutions. If, if you, if you uh, want Iran to get around financial sanctions, you need another block composed of countries that can buy oil and sell commodities that Iran needs. That block is still in the making. Uh, there is some very uh, weak good news, like Iran joining BRICS. I'm optimistic that if US overuses its sanctions, it will persuade these other countries to find a kind of a trading area. And maybe even a currency will emerge in that trading block that will do what the dollar does. Until that happens, it's very hard to imagine Iran growing from its three, four percent per year to seven, eight percent that it has grown in the past under the Islamic Republic in the 2000s, bit of help from oil market, Iran was growing at 9% per year. Uh, and that's what you need, given the youth bulge that has now entered in their 30s, uh, and they're still kind of not having decent jobs, they're doing work here and there, so employment grows, but Iran is not able to create good jobs for uh, the children of the revolution, the ones who were born in the 1980s. And that requires the classic uh, arrangements for international trade. Again, I emphasize no country has been able to develop in the last 100 years without international trade. So I hope Iranians will understand that selling oil on the open seas and bringing the cash back to the country is not getting around the sanctions. It is allowing yeah. a small producer to freely export what they want and bring the money back to the country. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a great segue to one of the questions that we got in the audience. Um, so the question is whether uh, UN sanctions, uh, whether the sanctions on oil and gas are UN sanctions or sanctions imposed by the United States, and also, which countries are respecting these sanctions? So you, you pointed to a group of countries that are helping Iran sell its oil, and also the financial san uh, sanctions that have been very devastating. So can you answer this question and elaborate on that? Sure, I'll try. Ali can help me uh, with a lot of the details. Uh, Ali, please step in. <laughs> first of all, uh, no country can uh, fully defy the United States. Even China is in some kind of uh, agreement with the U.S. that it can uh, buy Iranian oil. In any case, they are in dispute. So this is a good time for Iran to sell some oil to China while the Chinese are confronting U.S. on multiple fronts. Uh, but in principle, uh, China's economy depends very much on trade with the United States. Its companies are integrated. And this is going to be the case for several years until uh, U.S. and China uh, have a fallout. And then China will, would, have, would bear no cost if it defied the secondary sanctions and buy it in, uh, oil, from, oil from Iran. Ali, can you... Add to the first part of the question. Currently, there are no UN sanctions uh, on, on Iran. In fact, all UN sanctions were lifted uh, in 2015 uh, when the Security Council unanimously approved uh, the, the nuclear deal with Iran. 
there were only some restricted uh, restrictive measures that remained in place on uh, Iran's ability to buy or sell uh, conventional weapons, and that came off in October of 2020, uh, and also some restrictions on Iran's uh, missile program, uh, and that also came off uh, in October of last year. Uh, so there are currently no more UN sanctions on Iran. What uh, exists is uh, uh, only and purely uh, uh, unilateral U.S. sanctions, which of course uh, uh, some people tend to forget, it's not international law. Uh, the U.S. basically is enforcing its own uh, local law uh, on open seas uh, by, for instance, seizing uh, Iranian oil tankers. Uh, which uh, uh, you know, even a former Trump administration official uh, used to uh, 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 call it uh, piracy. Uh, you know, uh, because again, it's it's uh, enforcing uh, U.S. law uh, internationally, uh, which from many uh, countries' perspectives is uh, is seen as uh, illegal. Uh, now, China uh, uh, in twenty uh, in early two thousand tens used to cooperate uh, with the United States because it had uh, the same non-proliferation objective of preventing Iran from moving towards nuclear weapons. Uh, but also uh, was on much better terms with the U.S. Uh, now, given the degree of tensions between uh, China and, and the U.S., uh, I would say Beijing is much less interested in helping out the United States. Uh, and, and this really puts a limit on how far the U.S. can go in enforcing uh, its sanctions on uh, Iran's key, and some people would even say sole, uh, oil, oil customer, which is China. Iran also sells oil to Syria or to Venezuela, but that seems to be more a uh, policy to support allies rather than a policy in, uh, uh, for which Iran gains uh, uh, financially. Uh, so China is key here, but if the U.S. is now to, and you hear this in a policy based in Washington quite a bit, uh, that the Biden administration has been too weak in enforcing uh, U.S. sanctions against Iran. Well, that basically boils down to enforcing sanctions against China. And uh, the banks that uh, China is using for uh, its oil trade with Iran have no U.S. nexus. Um, so you have to go to the next level and start sanctioning uh, Chinese state institutions. Um, and given the degree of U.S. debt that these institutions have bought, this is really a, a, a global economic warfare that would have devastating impact for the U.S. economy as well. So we have kind of really reached the limit of uh, how far the U.S. can go in putting uh, pressure on uh, on Iranian economy. Now, you can definitely create a dent uh, in Iranian oil exports to, to China by, for instance, uh, targeting the way stations that Iran uses to uh, send its oil to China. We know uh, in Oman or in Indonesia or in Malaysia, some of Iranian oil gets mixed up with other oils and then gets imported into China. Uh, or you can seize tankers. Uh, uh, so there are, there are some ways of putting pressure, but I would argue that at best would create a 300 to 400,000 barrel dent in Iran's uh, almost 1.2 million barrels uh, oil export to, uh, to China. Now, at best, that would get the dial of sanctions, which uh, I would argue is currently 8 out of 10, to 9 out of 10. Uh, and, you know, if Iran has survived uh, 8 out of 10 uh, degrees of sanction, that one extra level is not going to be a, a game changer, but it also comes at a cost. Iran is uh, staying, it's very close to uh, uh, weapons-grade uranium. It's enriching to 60%, which is almost 90% of the effort that it gets to get uh, to weapons grade uranium, but it's not yet really enriching to 90%, uh, which is weapons grade. Well, if we enforce sanctions and Iran starts in, uh, enriching to weapons grade, then what? Then the same people who are arguing for enforcing sanctions will say the US would have to take military action. And this again goes to one of the core messages in the book, uh, which is that sanctions are often a path of least resistance because they're attractive to both hawks and doves in Washington. They're attractive to hawks because they see it as a way of penalizing an adversary and weakening it uh, in the hope that it would either surrender or it would be coupled uh, by its own population. 
and they're attractive to uh, to the to the dogs in, in U.S. politics because uh, they see it as an alternative to war. The problem is when sanctions fail, then you're left with no option other than uh, resorting uh, to conflict, uh, and, and this is this is big risk. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, and we have another follow up question to that. Uh, I think Javad mentioned a little bit, um, uh, but uh, the question is that, is there any way uh, to provide Iran with some kind of relief from financial sanctions, but to make sure that the revenue is going toward benign internal uses? I'm assuming by that, the question means that not toward military or nuclear uh, weapons. Is there any way, there have been some uh, suggestions, I think, so that the, the, the money from the transactions go toward medicine and food? Well, uh, the restrictions uh, that uh, limit uh, say Iranian exports to food and others is not going to guarantee that the money is not going to say the IRGC to sanction institutions because those institutions can produce uh, you know fruit juice and export it. Uh, the difficulty is the information uh, you need to monitor the system may very much scuttle the trade. Until we have better information, the technological improvement where you could easily determine where the money is going, I doubt very much uh, that that can happen. The other thing you have to notice is that in the US, there is no sympathy for Iran not growing. So there is the sanctioning agent agencies are not going to find a way to allow uh, some small producer in a small city to find customers outside. They're, that's, they're not losing sleep over that. And the reason why they're not losing sleep over that because this other alternative to sanctions and war, which we haven't talked about, and the book doesn't talk a whole lot about, which is diplomacy, getting to know each other and trying to do trade. Uh, that hasn't proven itself. We don't have many examples. Uh, we don't know what would have happened if Cubans had been trading with the U.S. all these 70 years. Would, would it still be a communist country? We don't know. There are people who argue this way and that way. And uh, just as you, you, you were talking uh, a minute ago uh, about uh, uh, the where the money might go, uh, you know, producing things for exports is risky enough. You're not going to get people to uh, invest in Iran with all the difficulties Iran has. Iran is not a good place to be a producer. There is arbitrary power, you know, rules change all the time, the exchange rate changes all the time. Uh, so even when you have the ability uh, to trade, people may want to take their money outside. It's big firms from outside that can afford to spend, uh, to invest in Iran, but local producers may prefer to go somewhere else. Uh, I don't know when that business climate is going to improve, but uh, if you have any uh, inkling that US will interfere with that trade, uh, you either get people to go after rent seeking, which is a great uh, path to success. You get close to the government, you know, close to the bonyards, the foundations, you get their business and you make money to uh, come up with new ideas and invest for on them, very risky business, and then have to tolerate this other added risk that no producer in any other country has to face, which is they may produce something, they may invest in something, and the US may come, may come and say, no, no, that's dual use. You can't do that. Uh, so I would say that is not going to work. I think what needs to happen, the possibilities are, one, Iran begins to negotiate with, with the West and come to an agreement 
that is deeper understanding. What would have happened if Trump had not uh, exited? That's my view. I think uh, having had another five, six years of JCPOA, things would have changed. The easing of sanctions may have still been slow, not to the uh, liking of Iranians, but we would be in a much better place uh, than uh, in that case than we are we are now. Do you think Iran has irreversibly moved beyond West's influence now? I think so. I think, you know, uh, the way uh, I look at Iran, uh, everything is moving in one direction from BRICS and investment in, in, in work with Chinese and then selling drones to Russia, people emigrating. Uh, I don't see uh, this geopolitical story changing. Of course, the U.S. and Israel have also gone their own way, making it much harder for Iran to work with them. In the last uh, eight, seven, several months, uh, the Middle East has become more polarized because of what is happening in, in, in Gaza. So I'm pessimistic about uh, the relationship with the West improving uh, I would put my hope on improving internal relations in Iran. You know, Iran is itself polarized mm -hmm. and not over geopolitics, over uh, women's attire, over a lot of social restrictions, over economic policy. If Iran moves to fix those divisions, which are completely unrelated to sanction and other things, then it may have a chance to go outside and try to mend those relationships. As long as you have this uh, polarization inside Iran, these are people, uh, social forces that pull the country in opposite directions, it is very hard to have a sensible long-term foreign policy. Of course, uh, you know, uh, nothing is forever. Um, and I, I have to say that uh, I think in terms of Iran's foreign policy, if you look at uh, not just decades, but uh, almost uh, three centuries of uh, recent contemporary Iranian uh, foreign policy history, um, where Iran finds its uh, comfort zone uh, is really in negative balancing between great powers. Uh, it has never been comfortable fully being in one camp, uh, even under the Shah, who was very pro-Western. Uh, he had good relations with uh, the Soviet Union as well, uh, as of, out of necessity, of course, and, uh, and normalized relations uh, with, with communist China. Uh, and, and so we're not yet at a point that uh, this cannot be uh, reversed or, or balanced, uh, which again, I think is where Iranians are, are most comfortable. Um, but uh, the, the, the longer this situation lasts, uh, the deeper the rupture becomes and the more difficult it will be uh, to repair uh, relations. But still to this day, uh, most uh, uh, Iranian uh, officials or uh, Iranian elite would prefer to send their children to live in the West and to study English rather than Chinese or, uh, or Russian. Uh, but again, these patterns are changing, uh, and uh, and one has to be uh, pretty conscious of uh, of the long term uh, implications uh, of the realities that sanctions create. Mm. And you know, uh, there's a question that I think is for you, Ali. Uh, uh, if Russia can continue to sell oil to India, uh, other. Uh, countries, how can the U.S. continue with sanctions as a plausible policy? Yeah, so look, uh, one uh, effect of the overuse of sanctions is that uh, after a while, uh, countries would start uh, negotiating uh, with the U.S. to get uh, specific exemptions. Uh, in the case of Iran, for instance, today you have um, uh, Iraq, which is a, a key neighbor of Iran and is completely dependent uh, on Iranian uh, export of electricity and natural gas, uh, negotiating with the U.S. to get waivers from U.S. sanctions. Even the Trump administration, uh, uh, which was much tougher in enforcement of sanctions, uh, I, I think that's uh, beyond questioning, um, could not cut off 
uh, Iraq's dependence on Iranian uh, energy sources because uh, a third of uh, the lights in Iraq would go off if they were to cut off uh, Iraq from uh, importing Iranian electricity. Uh, same applies to Iran's trade relations with Dubai, for instance. In all these years, decades of ups and downs of U.S. sanctions, uh, that relationship has been uh, something that uh, the U.S. has not been able to cut off. It has fluctuated, but it has never uh, been uh, been cut off. And, and even today, the UAE is the second largest uh, uh, trading partner of Iran. Uh, and, and India and other countries are doing the same thing. Now, uh, in the case of Russia, of course, uh, the stakes are much higher for India, and therefore India uh, uh, can manage to negotiate with the U.S. and, and try to get away with uh, not complying with U.S. sanctions uh, on, uh, on Russia, and that applies to a lot of other countries in the global south as well. Uh, but let's also remember that India got an exemption from the Trump administration. Uh, to continue its investment in the Chabahar port uh, in Iran, which also India saw as strategic uh, mm. and uh, to its interests. Uh, and, and again, this is one of uh, the side effects of the overuse of sanctions. When you start targeting uh, a little island uh, uh, like uh, uh, Cuba or a uh, hermit kingdom like uh, North Korea, uh, it's, uh, it, it has different stakes. And when you start sanctioning uh, a major uh, exporter of oil like Iran or a major uh, exporter of natural gas like Russia, uh, the stakes start becoming uh, quite different. And, and again, this is uh, one of the reasons that in the long run, I think the U.S. will start weakening the dominance of uh, the dollar in the global financial system. We already see countries moving in the direction of trying to de-dollarize their bilateral trade. Uh, I don't think this is an immediate threat, uh, but if we continue on this trajectory, uh, then in the medium term, uh, it is very likely uh, to to uh, uh, to create alternative uh, financial systems uh, to, to the one that we have today. Mm -hmm. uh, Javad, what happened to the handouts that the government was giving to people, especially people who were on lower income uh, levels, and subsidies. Uh, there were lots of sub subsidized items, uh, food, uh, also energy. What has happened to those? Well, uh, energy subsidies persist. It was mm -hmm. an attempt, a good attempt, in my view, to eliminate them. Uh, the va their value is very sizable, uh, perhaps 20% of Iran's GDP. So, uh, if uh, you look back in 2010, when a law was passed to remove energy subsidies and uh, use the proceeds to deposit cash in people's accounts, uh, that experiment was successful in the sense that it was done. Very few countries have uh, double, trebled energy prices without riots or government change. Iran was able to do that. And the only reason why it was able to do that was because he was depositing uh, money in people's bank accounts. That's what you meant by handout, the cash transfers. They were actually not so much as handout. I think uh, the uh, correct interpretation is that is Iran's uh, income from its oil wealth, which instead of giving it to the government to build roads and schools and so on, which rarely does in a just manner, uh, more roads and schools, uh, money spent in richer areas like Tehran than in Sistan and Baluchistan or rural areas. The alternative to letting government to spend the money uh, is to give it the cash directly to people and they decide what they want to spend it on. You know, I have preference for giving the money to the government because investment is more likely to take place that way. But when that money is not properly or um, equitably spent, the alternative becomes valuable, at least for part of that money. Now, that program uh, uh, became victim of uh, political differences inside Iran between the moderates and the uh, conservatives. Uh, oddly, conservatives were in favor of liberalizing the energy prices. And, the, uh, and they're the, one, the ones who had 
the requisite mechanism to do that, which was the cash transfer. Uh, Rouhani, when he came to power, he expressly uh, expressed his disdain for cash transfers. His economists echoed that. And uh, so they didn't do anything about that. Uh, Raisi hasn't touched uh, energy prices himself, but he did something similar to what Ahmadinejad did by removing subsidy for food and medicine, especially food. Some of the food items like red meat are also inequitably distributed, the subsidy for them, because the consumption of red meat by the top decile is two and a half times that of the lowest decile. In energy or in gasoline is 10 times. Uh, so that's much less equitably divided. But he removed that uh, uh, energy, which uh, that subsidy that was substantial. You know, they, they were selling each dollar for 4,200 two months. They raised the price to 2,800 and 500. So it's almost seven, six, seven times. And the money was again distributed uh, through the same mechanism. They have people's bank account numbers. They just press a button and the money flows to people. Uh, with some modification, uh, they re, uh, re revived the cash transfer program. The problem with these uh, uh, transfer programs is that they are one-time shots. They uh, come, uh, maybe they are making a big difference first when they are distributed, but then there's when you have 50% inflation, a year later, the value of the cash transfer has dropped by 50%. And in three, four years, it's become neg negligible. But on the whole, I should say Iran has done relatively well with social protection. It has other mechanisms of, for social prote protection. It has the Comité MDAD, which covers about 8 million people. Uh, they are not given cash. They are given help one way or the other. Uh, it's, a, it's a very elaborate system that has uh, become very effective for the last 40 years. Like uh, people are identified by neighbors instead of people applying or filling a form. They're recommended that this person who maybe is an old woman whose husband has died. And then the committee goes and tries to find out uh, what they can do for them. So the social protection is part of the reason, as we argue in the book, why the harsh sanctions have not uh, resulted in mass uh, uprisings. Um, Ali, we have a question whether U.S. can unilaterally seize Iranian assets outside international, I think, waters, perhaps, rules, like oil tankers. Well, it has done so, uh, and uh, the only mechanism that the Iranians came up with uh, to deter the U.S. from uh, continuing down this path uh, has been uh, to retaliate in kind uh, and in a disproportionate manner. Uh, so for every one tanker that the U.S. has seized, uh, the Iranians have seized two. Um, and of course, that is uh, a very risky gamble as well, because uh, in, in, uh, now you have uh, uh, two maritime coalitions in the Persian Gulf region uh, to try to secure the area, especially in the aftermath of the tensions that sanctions uh, that were enforced by the Trump administration in 2019 uh, resulted in attacks on shipping lanes, on tankers, on ports, on energy infrastructure in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, and, and you also now have uh, two maritime coalitions in the Red Sea. So there's a lot of friction, a lot of warships, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a single incident that results in casualties uh, can actually result in, uh, in, an, in an industry confrontation. Uh, and the effort that goes into um, seizing these tankers, uh, uh, you know, the intelligence uh, required uh, the ministry operation to seize them, uh, the transfer uh, of, uh, of these tankers to uh, the U.S., the selling of the oil, uh, and then uh, you know deciding what to do with the revenue uh, is just so complicated. It's so time-consuming that it's one of the least efficient ways of uh, enforcing uh, sanctions. And, it, 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 and again, uh, the, the risk of it uh, is that then you every time you achieve this, you then spare Iran to uh, retaliate in kind 
uh, which does the exact opposite of what the U.S. is trying to achieve, which is to try to pivot away from this region uh, and focus on a much bigger strategic question like uh, great power competition uh, with China. So we also have a question here, whether in your research or in the book, you offer recommendations. And I want to conclude with that question for both of you. Uh, you know, this has uh, been going on, this policy of putting pressure on Iran for over four decades. It hasn't worked. It has cha changed Iranian society in ways that, you know, it was not intended to. Um, I, I want both of you to, I mean, uh, answer the question whether the book offers any recommendations and for yourself, I mean, if you were going to advise uh, policymakers here in the U.S., what would you tell them? Um, if I can take a stab at that. Um... So there are uh, multiple recommendations uh, uh, that, that one can put forward. Um, I would say uh, the key one, uh, which is something we haven't really discussed tonight uh, at length, is the question of sanctions relief. Because sanctions are only as effective as the prospect of removing them if the target country actually does what you want, uh, which is to change its uh, behavior. Um, and we have a clear example of this, uh, again, with Iran uh, agreeing to a nuclear deal uh, that rolled back its nuclear program, put it in a box, and under the most rigorous uh, uh, international monitoring ever implemented anywhere in the world. Um, and yet, even under the Obama administration uh, in 2016, when the deal was being fully implemented and John Kerry was going around the world encouraging international banks to do business with Iran, uh, the U.S. was uh, unable to deliver uh, effective sanctions relief because that chilling effect of sanctions that I uh, mentioned at the beginning um, outlives often uh, the impact of sanctions uh, themselves um, and, uh, and is not easy to, uh, to dissipate. Um, and so uh, what, uh, what happened was that Iranians were very disappointed with sanctions relief uh, under the Obama administration. And then the bigger problem occurred, which was that the US proved that it's unable to provide sustainable uh, sanctions relief. So Iran basically uh, dismantled infrastructure on the ground, so facts on the ground, right? It destroyed uh, its heavy water uh, reactor, an irreversible, uh, or at least not reversible in the short run, reality on the ground. Uh, whereas the U.S. Uh, overnight was able to reimpose uh, all of its sanctions when uh, uh, President uh, Trump uh, withdrew from uh, the nuclear deal. Uh, and that left a very bad taste uh, 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 for the Iranians. Uh, and then we had another ex experience last year when uh, the Biden administration uh, reached a uh, prisoner slash humanitarian deal with Iran in which it did a swap of five uh, hostages in Iran, uh, and also agreed uh, to transfer uh, uh, $6 billion of Iranian frozen assets in South Korea to uh, uh, banks in Doha to be used for humanitarian trade. Now, uh, remember uh, that humanitarian trade is exempt under U.S. sanctions. Uh, so Iran should have been able to tap into those funds uh, all along anyways, uh, but it wasn't because the chilling effect of sanctions had deterred South Korean banks to allow Iran uh, to convert uh, currency that was frozen in, in that country and use it for uh, buying food and medicine. Um, the U.S. moved that money to Doha, created the humanitarian channel over which it had oversight and control. It could even veto uh, uh, Iranian purchases of, uh, of vaccines, for instance. Um, uh, and, and yet, after October 7th happened, and as soon as uh, Hamas fighters uh, paraglided into Israel uh, and committed those atrocities, uh, the U.S. Uh, restricted Iran's access to those assets. Uh, the humanitarian deal had nothing to do with Iranian regional policy or support for Hamas. Uh, and this wasn't the Trump administration uh, cheating on the commitments of its predecessor. This was the Biden administration reneging on its own commitments uh, that it had finalized just a few weeks earlier. 
Uh, and so that, I think, is extremely devastating, not just in the case of Iran, but in any other case. Because if, if the sanctioned country comes to the conclusion that the U.S. Uh, is not going to provide uh, effective and sustainable sanctions relief, then this becomes a one-way ratchet. Uh, and countries will come to the conclusion that uh, uh, the change of behavior is not going to have any impact. And uh, they should rather focus on circumventing and skirting uh, U.S. sanctions. Um, so our number one, I would say, suggestion to policymakers would be uh, that they have to figure out a way uh, to be able to use sanctions uh, as a tool of statecraft uh, in a manner that it actually provides uh, uh, effective and sustainable sanctions relief. And, and you know, in the title of the book, the reason we, we call it warfare is that sanctions actually kill people. Sanctions have uh, uh, devastating impacts for Iran, uh, for uh, any economy that is targeted by them. But yet, uh, unlike in wars, where you come to a uh, clean um, cut decision to uh, cease hostilities, uh, get a ceasefire, end the war, um, the president uh, in the US cannot unilaterally decide on ending sanctions. Uh, you need to negotiate with Congress, and you need to also get states uh, to uh, end their own divestment and sanctions against uh, against the targeted uh, country. Uh, and that is only done if you get a treaty, which of course is extremely difficult in a polarized uh, environment in Washington to do uh, on a toxic subject like Iran. Uh, and even if you get a treaty, the president can still uh, withdraw from it with, with a stroke of a pen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these are really extremely big problems that uh, are structural and would have to be addressed uh, in a serious uh, manner if this tool is to remain uh, um, a, a serious part of U.S. Uh, foreign policy. And last point, and I'll end on this, um, is that uh, another point that the book argues for is that there is a need for a constant assessment and reassessment of the impact of sanctions. You cannot have just the quantity, uh, the sheer quantity of sanctions as uh, the main criteria of their effectiveness. You have to see if they're working, what are uh, their uh, side effects, what are their unintended consequences. You have to look at not just the economic implications, but also, again, social, cultural, uh, uh, generational at times uh, implications of sanctions, and adjust your policy accordingly. If you're not meeting your objectives, you should follow a different course, not just to add on sanctions and layer them uh, in order to uh, feel good about uh, uh, imposing uh, sanctions and doing something about uh, uh, policies of a country uh, that you don't like. Uh, uh, Nazila, in, in the past 20 years, the U.S. has increased uh, its sanctions by 900%, not just on Iran, on any, any country that it's uh, uh, sanctioned. Um, and it was only last year uh, that the Biden administration hired economists uh, at uh, the Treasury Department, at OFAC, uh, which is responsible for enforcing sanctions, to start looking at the economic implications of sanctions. It was only last year, after 20 years, a 900% increase in, in the use of sanctions. Uh, I think that's just inadequate. Uh, not only OFAC needs uh, uh, more economists, but it also needs uh, social scientists, uh, anthropologists, uh, 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 sociologists, uh, psychologists, uh, to try to better understand uh, the implications of sanctions. And then the U.S. needs to have uh, the nimbleness that is required uh, to use this tool uh, as uh, a tool that advances uh, diplomacy, not a tool that makes diplomacy impossible. And I want to remind our audience that you are an advisor to the current administration. Uh, not in any official capacity. But it's important that you do talk about uh, these recommendations and have been in a position to also give them to the administration. Can... Um. We conclude this with your comments, Java. This has been an amazing conversation. And I do want to hear, our audience wants to hear about your thoughts and uh, what recommendations you have. Uh, well, I was going to add to what Ali was saying, which is essentially if you're in a hole, stop digging. 
sanctions have become a hold. Uh, it's very difficult to get out of it. Uh, they didn't expect Iran to become more belligerent. They didn't expect Iranians to become stronger vis-a-vis -vis the civil society in Iran. Uh, but those things have happened. Uh, what needs to happen now is first a realization that something went wrong. And I'm not very optimistic on that. I was listening to a conversation between Tarek Massoud of uh, uh, Harvard's Middle East Initiative and Jared Kushner. And Jared's big uh, plan for if Trump comes to power is, first of all, to strangle Iran. And his idea is that we, uh, we need to remove Iran's cash from their disposal. His argument is that we were almost there. Had Biden not come to power, Iran would have surrendered by now. That's a total misunderstanding of the data and what has happened. And to reduce economic impact to cash in Iran's or government's coffers is also pretty uh, simplistic. Uh, what we need is a better understanding of uh, Iran, that it, the fact that it has politics. It's not just France and England and European countries that have political functions, uh, factions and they have legitimate each faction has its own legi legitimate needs. Iran is very similar to that. And uh, I am uh, reminded that one third of Iranians have consistently voted for conservatives. So it's not like all Iranians want one thing. Iranians are very divided. Iran has an equal distribution of income. The revolution has not quite fixed that. Uh, it has poverty. And they disagree on how to fix that. Uh, the moderates, pro-Western uh, politicians in Iran have argued for years that if we go reattach ourselves to Europe, everybody will benefit. That's not what the lower half of Iranians uh, have experienced. They know when oil prices go up, the money first goes to Tehran. It improves lives in Tehran and then slowly, slowly, if ever, gets to poorer areas of Iran. And uh, the Iranian politicians have been uh, very uh, slow in recognizing that income inequality makes it very hard to get everyone on board to have a unified policy externally. If the U.S. understood that, and understood that if Iranians, this is advice by they, by by the way, they would easily give to Mexico, fix your income distribution, or to uh, to Brazil. But in in the case of Iran, uh, there is nothing that Iranians can do that the U.S. would recommend that would improve the situation for the U.S. and for everybody. Uh, I think uh, making Iran and all Iranians look like evil, an evil nation. Uh, you know, I've heard Biden say you don't negotiate with evil. And that's a kind of a, a, a phrase that we hear a lot from U.S. politicians. So recognize that those Iranians who oppose the U.S. and who support the government right now, uh, the 18 million who voted even in the last election uh, for the parliament, uh, which most of whom are conservative, they need to come on board. They are citizens of, citizens of Iran, and U.S. cannot just deal with the so-called good Muslims, good Iranians, and hope that the good Muslims will uh, side with the U.S. against their own government and will deliver uh, policy change at the uh, external level for the U.S. That will not happen. It's true that many Iranians oppose their government, but that doesn't mean that they prefer U.S. interference to their own government. You know, the history of uh, U.S. and Iran has been very tragic uh, since 1950s, you know, the coup and then support for the Shah and so on. So I think, uh, you know, international conflicts are very difficult to uh, solve, especially when they get so uh, deep and set. Uh, I don't know if 
US, U.S. is going to solve this problem with Russia now that Ukraine war has been going on. But stopping uh, coal from going further and trying to understand what went wrong. It's good that they have two economists now working on Iran at the Treasury Department, because maybe they can dissuade Jared Kushner if he comes uh, to power with Trump again, that uh, Iran Iranian economy is not a bank account with a pot of money and you take the money out of the pot and everything collapses. Uh, that there are people who are very productive, they work, they sell stuff. Uh, Iranians uh, have almost every app that you can imagine in this country, uh, from Uber to uh, cooking and ordering food. They have made that for Iran and they're, they're, they're working. Did we predict this when we said you cannot uh, buy U.S. computer chips or equipment? No, we didn't. So I think it's better to be more humble about the new Iran, the new global economy as well, and uh, recognize that U.S. needs to get along with Iran rather than come with a heavy hand and say, do as I say, the way Mike Pompeo said. Uh, in 2018, and it really backfired. Well, thank you so much. This was great, uh, Ali Javad. Thank you so much. Thanks to our audience for their wonderful questions. And thanks to uh, our, the people who organized this uh, event. Uh, and I hope that you all have a great evening. Thank you, Nazila. Thank you for uh, the uh, Columbia DC uh, to put this uh, together. I really enjoyed the conversation and learned a lot. Absolutely. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.